This is a clip from the hit TV series, Parks and Recreation. 128 ounce option. Most people call it a gallon, but they call it the regular. Now, let's see what that same clip would be like if we added a laugh track. 128 ounce option. Most people call it a gallon, but they call it the regular. It seems so wrong, but for most of television history, it was so right. Over the last half century or so, almost every comedy on television had canned laughter. From I Love Lucy to The Big Bang Theory. For some, the laughter is viewed as an imposition. For others, a secondary character you almost forgot was there, until it wasn't anymore. In recent years, the laugh track has been used less and less as sitcoms in general have decreased in popularity. Let's break down where the mysterious laugh box came from and where it went. Before television existed, there was the ballet, the opera, magic, and comedy shows. When you went to one of these events, you were experiencing the audience reactions in real time. If something was shocking, you could hear and feel the gasps echo around you, and similarly, with laughter. But then came the radio, the first ever broadcast medium. Those communal reactions disappeared as American families gathered in their living rooms to be entertained. Radio producers wanted to develop a way to give people the live experience at home. The first ever laugh track began with Bing Crosby's radio show. Recording pioneer Jack Mullen recalls the creation to Channels of Communication, a trade journal in 1981. The hillbilly comic Bob Burns was on the show one time and threw a few of his then extremely racy and off-color folksy farm stories into the show. We recorded it live and they all got enormous laughs, but we couldn't use the jokes. So scriptwriter Bill Murrow asked us to save the laughs. A couple of weeks later, he had a show that wasn't very funny and he insisted that we put in the salvage laughs. Thus, the laugh track was born. Fast forward to the era of early television. Comedies were filmed with a single camera in front of a live audience. That meant that each scene would be filmed multiple times from multiple angles, instead of the multi-cams today, which have multiple cameras capturing one take. Those separate angles and takes would be cut together, and when that happened, the laughter was inconsistent. Audiences would laugh at the wrong time, too loudly, for too long, and were simply unreliable. In the late 1940s, CBS sound engineer Charlie Douglas noticed those inconsistencies and couldn't take it anymore. If a joke didn't get a desired laugh, he would insert one with the use of a laugh track. This technique became known as sweetening. Douglas went so far as to create a physical laugh box. According to Ron Simon, curator of television and radio at the Paley Center for Media, the device was about three feet tall, the shape of a filing cabinet, very heavy, and had slots for 32 reels, which could hold 10 laughs each. It was officially named the Audience Response Duplicator, but it became known as the Laugh Box. At its best, the Laugh Box could hold 320 laughs. Press them one at a time, and you get a singular laugh. Press multiple keys at once, and a symphony of laughter would play. Each key represented a different age, sex, and style of laugh, with a foot pedal regulating the length. The laugh box was mysterious, though. Since Douglas owned the patent and created all of them, nobody outside of him and his family members had ever seen the inside of the machine. And when Douglas wasn't around, the machine was kept tightly padlocked. In an interview with TV Guide in 1966, Dick Hobson said, if the laugh box should start acting strangely, the laugh boys wheel it into the men's room, locking the door behind them so no one can peek. I mentioned the name Charlie Douglas, and it's like Cosa Nostra, Everybody starts whispering. It's the most taboo topic in TV. The first sitcom to use the laugh box was the short-lived series, The Hank McCune Show, in 1950. The idea of recorded laughter spread throughout Hollywood, and by the 1960s, almost every single camera sitcom was utilizing canned laughter. But it was only Douglas that engineered the laughing for everyone for almost a decade. For $100, Douglas would wheel the mysterious box to each studio on a dolly and sit with the producers in a screening room and decide what kind of laughter and when. Eventually, Douglas hired a second in command to keep up with the 100 hours of television he needed to sweeten, and the rest was history. 
Multicam sitcoms were popularized and shows like Friends, Frasier, Seinfeld, and more incorporated canned laughter. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! The actors and actresses would know to hold for laughter, knowing that each scene would be sweetened. This is the world's worst hangover! The Discovery Channel documentary, The One That Goes Behind the Scenes, shows how it works. Sometimes the audience responds too big. If I went with the actual laugh, so that laugh is still going through her next line into his next reaction. And that's it's five, six seconds. And in TV land, that's an eternity. Sometimes we have to put in a laughter that is shorter. It felt like comedies would be like this forever. And then The Big Bang Theory went off the air in 2019 and took with it one of the last multi-cam sitcoms with canned laughter. When we look at the television landscape today, almost every single comedy is a single camera comedy and not a multi-cam sitcom with canned laughter. You can count on two hands how many multi-cam sitcoms that use a laugh track are on TV right now. And not to mention those that went off the air this year. The use of the laugh track has almost disappeared completely from the TV lineup. So what changed? Dead air in television used to be frowned upon, and shows would push for laugh tracks whenever possible. Bill Cosby claimed his first sitcom, The Bill Cosby Show, that ran from 1961 to 1971, failed because he had insisted on not using a laugh track. Not to be confused with the very successful The Cosby Show that aired in the 1980s and did have a laugh track. And MASH fought to not have a laugh track at all, but they came to a compromise with the studio. They would use the canned laughter, but just not during the very serious OR scenes. While we associate the 80s and the 90s with the laugh track, that was actually the time when single camera comedies without canned laughter started to take over. A key player in this transition was HBO. Their shows Dream On in 1990 and The Larry Sanders Show in 1992 ran without laugh tracks and even garnered praise for doing so. The airing of these shows proved that comedies could exist, and exist successfully without laugh tracks. Other studios took notice and began to follow suit. Then came Curb Your Enthusiasm, Malcolm in the Middle, Scrubs, Arrested Development, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, 30 Rock, The Office, and the list goes on and on. Writers and producers were excited by the change, as it allowed them to stray from the constant stream of punchlines to explore character-based humor. Another reason the laugh track fell to the wayside? According to Mike Royce, the co-showrunner of Netflix's One Day at a Time, I think one of the reasons why people don't like laugh tracks is they don't like to be told how to react. It's an American thing. Don't tell me what the f to laugh at. The Big Bang Theory was one of the last big sitcoms that used canned laughter. And even their creator, Chuck Lorre, insisted that absolutely no sweetening took place on any of his series, which also include Two and a Half Men and Mike and Molly, stating, I do not and have never sweetened my shows with fake laughs. I've always thought it was pretty hateful and a self-defeating practice. For now, the laugh track lives in a very strange state. It's used in very few shows, but lives on in the reruns of ever-popular series like Friends, How I Met Your Mother, and more. Perhaps history might repeat itself, and we'll see a resurgence in multicam sitcoms and the laugh track. Until then, we can thank streaming services like Netflix and Hulu for keeping Charlie Douglas's legacy in our living rooms. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And ring the bell below, that way you're notified whenever we post a new video.